So stories, not narratives, sit at the heart of human experience. We appear in different guises, homo economicus, the rational, the self-interested, homo faber, the maker or the builder, and the one I prefer, which is homo communicator, the storyteller. I raise this because the world appears to have gone narrative mad. And um, I reached the end of my particular road. One Saturday evening, I was sitting at home. I was watching uh, television, late night television. I was watching the football highlights. And uh, one young player was behaving badly during a match. And for all his promise, for all his talent, he, is, he appeared to be on the road to becoming a serial offender. And that was the conclusion of one after-match commentator. And he claimed that the player, quote, better get himself a narrative pretty quickly, unquote, before he ruined a promising career. At which point I thought, game over. Forget it. No more narratives. So narrative has become a catchword that means all things to all people. It's lost any real sense of meaning or reality. So this conference rightly singles out as the operative theme and that we should focus on the story and, and use storytelling as its vehicle. So a long time ago when I was a student of literature at Oxford, a story had a plot, and it had characters. It also had a narrator, perhaps in the first person, or the all-seeing, all-knowing, authorial voice. And then later, when I became a journalist, a new story for me was something we wrote to explain what was happening in the world. It had shape, it had a beginning, it had a middle, and it had an end. And it was bounded by a word count or a restriction on the number of minutes and seconds that we could use. Today, as a political scientist, a story is an account of reality manufactured by individuals to offer a subjective understanding of how they see the world out there. Now, alongside story sits myth. This is a difficult one. Uh, some scholars prefer to call myths meta-narratives. Okay, narratives have gone. So have meta-narratives, as far as I'm concerned. That means, <clears throat> in, in their view, these are overarching, hegemonic understandings that travel far and wide, and they attract broad or universal recognition. I see nothing wrong in calling these big stories, such as... These are the kind of big stories that we've heard over decades, you know. Um, everyone has the right to free speech. Even the old socialist workers of the world unite. What about the Christian? Uh, the meek shall inherit the earth. Or even the American, everyone born in the United States, can become president. They are imaginative frameworks into which we can insert smaller stories, offering them cohesion, coherence, and continuity when viewed side by side. And they offer definition, they offer identity, they offer meaning to our insecurities and self-discovery. Now, states are rooted in stories. They need a story, a unified and authoritative story. More accurately, they need to control history through the state's way of justifying how it has the exclusive right to secure the well-being of every individual in the nation in exchange for constraining citizens' freedom to act. Some kind of social contract of mutual give and take underpins this assumption. It anchors state power 
and it legitimized its right to exclusive control over our lives. Since they who control the past, the story of the past, in other words, official history, can claim legitimacy in the present and stake ownership to the future. States build monuments. They create heroes. They fashion rituals and ceremonies. They draw maps and place, them, place their own state at the center of the map. And they celebrate historic events to solidify the ambiguities of the past through a common story. It's precisely due to the different kinds of storytelling that states and business have chosen to keep their distance from one another. 100 years ago, Britain was engaged in the Great War with Germany. Millions of men were sent to their deaths in the name of the nation state. Dulce et decorum est pro patria mori, wrote the poet Wilfred Owens with cruel irony in 1917. It is sweet and honorable to die for one's country. The British pop propaganda industry, to which later Adolf Hitler would attribute Germany's defeat in World War I, was rarely unified, even within the British government. There were three businessmen, three entrepreneurs, three newspaper barons, Lord Beaverbrook, Lord Rothermere, and Lord Northcliffe. And they became ministers of information and propaganda in the wartime government, but they had to endure criticism. One leading member of parliament argued, the functions of the press are not the functions of the government. And the functions of the government are not the functions of the press. And it's not possible without misconception and misunderstanding that they should be combined in the same person. In short, we want to know whose story we're listening to. In the week preceding the vote on whether to invade Iraq in March 2003, businessman and media baron Rupert Murdoch phoned the UK Prime Minister Tony Blair three times, according to Blair's Director of Communications. And Murdoch warned that it would be dangerous to delay invasion. Diaries reveal that Murdoch was pressing on timings, saying how News International, his company, would support the government. So whose story were we listening to? Firms in the private sector are not immune to storytelling. They live in, they depend on, a world of corporate branding. They depend on product brands. Brand is the essence of the way the corporation sees itself and wishes to be understood in the consumer marketplace. These are the values that support the authenticity of the product and the firm as guarantor of ethical and quality delivery. This is the story the firm tells of itself. Brands change, but when they do, it's frequently with much soul-searching on the part of executives. And change should be slow, incremental if not to delegitimize everything the company has said about itself previously. There are, of course, one or two famous stories that question this assumption of gradualism. In the 1920s, Marlboro cigarettes held a strong position in the marketplace among women smokers. But by the 1950s, competition grew. Claims of cancer kills began to appear and sales figures among women fell. The Philip Morris Company decided to reposition the brand, but radically. It set out to tell a new story about its customers. It shifted from the feminine lifestyle brand that had appealed to women and embraced a new story that found favor with urban and also rural consumers. Marlborough Man became the iconographic male cowboy, selling to men, an aesthetic of idealized male strength and virtue 
met a wistful longing for freedom and escape, perhaps against the background of growing nine-to-five suburban routine. This idealized story turned sales around. Go on to the uh, Finnish company's, uh, company Nokia's website today, and on the homepage you'll see this, uh, this as part of an ad. And it's a stylish watch. And the copy says, Nokia Steel limited editions are crafted with an eye to luxury watchmaking so you can elevate your style while keeping track of your health. Read further, and we're told, we design technologies for connected health and immersive experiences. 20 years ago, the name of Finland's biggest company, Nokia, was the go-to brand for mobile telephones before it was outmaneuvered and outcompeted in a dynamic marketplace. Nevertheless, the romance survives today in retro storytelling. But from its birth, in 1865, as a paper pulp mill, it's experienced different lives, including electricity generation, later taking under its wing a rubber company, and a metal cable company, before becoming the market leader in mobile telecoms in 1990s. From a brand perspective, however, there are many stories here to tell. If public confidence is vested in longevity, in recognition and reliability, how did the company continually reinvent itself over 170 years? And how did it get away with it? And the answer, I think, is the art of storytelling. Economists teach us to separate out the public and the private sectors. Seldom do we see the public-private story of benefit or, co or cooperation. Possibly the biggest story in our times is that of the internet, which would come to be the infrastructural foundation of the consumer World Wide Web, created as the ARPANET by DARPA in the Department of Defense and US computer scientists. When Apple Macintosh computers launched in 1984, the commercials were stunning. They told the story of, of smashing the dystopia of Big Brother state surveillance. They were explicitly marketed as devices one could use to tear down bureaucracies and achieve intellectual freedom. That's how one commentator explained it. The Macintosh was a meeting point where counterculture interfaced with high technology to challenge the man. And I wonder what we think of that story today in a world where the news is one, or rather, the new story is one of cyber penetration and surveillance by the Russian state on our democratic states. One of the world's richest companies is Apple. And the GPS, Global Positioning System, on its iPhones and iPads was a restricted military tool in the 1970s until it was made available to the consumer market. That story is a story of private enterprise and consumer take-up. The US Air Force, however, is still improving that GPS system <coughs> at a cost of 700 million US dollars per year. Apple's Siri technology, which is a personal organizer, is also the child of military initiative and funding. Once again, DARPA approached Stanford Research Institute, SRI, in 2000 to act as project leader. And SRI sold the application to Apple when the iPhone launched seven years later. 
So the story of mutual cooperation is one rarely highlighted. It certainly doesn't fit the high-tech, garage-to-guru story of the self-made Silicon Valley entrepreneurs. The conclusion of one leading academic is that the state has been behind most technological revolutions and periods of long-run growth. A failure to get that story across means the state has fallen victim to rhetorical and ideological agendas and not taken credit for the degree of risk-taking and big vision that the private sector rarely wishes to match when committing resources and investment on a large scale. So public-private storytelling has always been apparent if only we cared to look for it. Thank you.